Hello everybody and welcome to CRA's uh, webinar, uh, The Life Cycle of a Risk Model. Uh, my name is Rory Kennedy and uh, I'm your host uh, for today. A little bit uh, about myself. I'm uh, uh, 16 years as uh, a rail safety consultant in uh, the United Kingdom, Australia and uh, in the Middle East, both work, having worked in the, the public and private sector. Um, a little bit about my risk modelling background. I uh, worked on the, the safety risk model in Great Britain, versions 3, 4 and 5, from uh, 2002 to 2007. And down in Australia, I was a custodian and a guiding mind behind uh, RailCorp's quantitative risk model. Uh, this, for those who don't know, RailCorp was the passenger operator and infrastructure manager in uh, uh, within a two-hour radius of uh, Sydney. Uh, I was also involved in uh, the level crossings uh, risk models, both in the UK and uh, Australia. So we have uh, Alcrum. All level crossings risk model in, in UK and ALCAM in Australia, the all level crossings assessment method, which we'll have a closer look at later, uh, as well as the user work crossings risk model and uh, also a structures over track risk model in uh, Australia. So I'm originally a master of physics. Uh, I'm currently the chief consultant for rail system safety at uh, CRA where our vision is uh, to be thought leaders delivering quality in the fields of risk management, risk analysis, and safety management. So a little bit about our audience today. We have uh, approximately 30 people uh, attending uh, from uh, 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 just less than five countries at last check. So we've got uh, predominantly Australia and uh, the United Kingdom and uh, representation of uh, cross-section of industries. So uh, welcome to everybody. Uh, today's uh, agenda, I'll be giving a, uh, an overview of, uh, consider what it is to be a risk model and why do we have them. Uh, risk models in the context of the, the, the system life cycle. So I've had a, uh, a look and considered the use of risk models in railways, metros and tramways uh, today across the world and uh, we'll have a look at some of the strengths, the weaknesses, opportunities, I'll propose some further uses of risk models and uh, looking forward to have a, uh, consider some of the systemic challenges uh, out there. So just for your information, the, the, the views that are expressed today are mine and mine alone. Um, so uh, I look forward to some uh, Q&A at uh, the end after an invite to a forum that we've got coming up later in the year. Uh, so for questions, appreciate you can't speak at uh, the moment, you're all uh, muted. Uh, this is intentional. Uh, you will have a uh, control panel uh, on your screen which enables you to type in questions. We'll have a look at these uh, as we get towards the end, so raise them as we're going through and uh, I'll We'll have a, a dedicated session at the end to address. Just for information, the resolution might get a little bit small at times. I'll upload the uh, PDF copy of uh, this presentation at the end of uh, our session. So what is a risk model? Well, when I was uh, preparing this, I thought of all the, the products that are produced in the um, the arena of risk modeling at uh, different stages of the life cycle. So a couple of examples, you've got failure modes effects analysis, uh, you've got criticality analysis and diagnostics, uh, hazard records, hazard logs, risk registers. And then my th thinking uh, went to some of the risk models that are out there. So in uh, the UK, I mentioned we've got the safety risk model that's become known now as the, the, the Great Britain safety risk model. Channel Tunnel Rail Link and uh, High Speed One, uh, they have their risk model now for about 15 years. HS2 have probably got one on the cards. Irish Rail, 
uh, they've adopted a, a more location specific approach. Um, the, the two level crossing methods uh, mentioned, the Rail Corp Safety Risk Register and it's uh, the quantified risk model that underpins uh, its uh, understanding of, uh, of risk. The structures over track risk model, uh, as mentioned, we're talking about bridges, airspace developments, anything in which uh, you've got a, a population that might be exposed to a derailing train. There is a, an Australian risk model that's on the cards at the moment, uh, and there's certainly some challenges there around uh, modeling the complexities of uh, multiple uh, operators and multiple infrastructure managers in uh, the one model. Also in the Middle East, uh, we have uh, existing and uh, future operators that are looking to adequately represent the, their design, operation and maintenance. So what com uh, commonalities did I uh, in this spy when uh, reviewing these models? So we've got the structure is the obvious one. Um, there are uh, complex system problems out there that no one person uh, knows the answer to and you might have many options on the table but um, structure is a, a critical uh, element to uh, a risk model. So if not one person knows the answer you've you need to get many people around the table from the engineering the operational disciplines um, there's some examples that are given there, we've got your civil and uh, your control systems, communications uh, experts on the operational side, train crewing, customer service, track maintenance, just to give some examples. Now, to give you an idea of what I mean by a system, because uh, that's a word that we, we use a lot, uh, as far as a railway is concerned, you've got this combination of hardware, software, people and environment. And for each one of those, they, they, there are new systems out there, there are legacy systems, we're trying to innovate all the time. And uh, these can affect our system at the top level. Beneath that system level, you have your subsystem level and there are multiple subsystems that reflect this complex, just multiply this complexity as we, we try and represent an overall understanding of what, it is, what our system is. There are inevitably some decisions to make. So you've got questions that you want to know the answer to today. You have questions that you might want to know the answer to tomorrow, but you don't know the question yet. Um, how do you build for that? How do you future-proof your risk model? You'll have uh, strategic investment questions, uh, return on investment, so the regulator needs to determine some kind of safety strategy for the, the, the industry. As a, an operator or an infrastructure manager, you might want to uh, make sure that you're spending uh, money in a, a risk-based approach uh, to address uh, issues. Early in the life cycle, you'll have decisions that are being made by your design and build contractors that will materially affect the uh, system that is left for our operators and maintainers to, to deal with. So are we really considering the, the impact of decisions at one stage of the life cycle and the impacts it might have further on down the life cycle? And do our regulatory and contractual arrangements, are there approvals processes, are they focused on uh, doing what's right for the system? So ultimately, uh, each player in the, the life cycle would be affected by the, the quality of uh, the decision it, decisions it makes. And we want to have confidence in our decisions. So uh, if our models are representing reality, can we, have, can we get some data to back up these models and uh, validate our position? Um, one question might be, do we really need that data? So are data essential for our models or can we get confidence another way? Let's just take a quick look at the context and legal context in the, the UK. Um, so why do we have a risk model? Typically there's some kind of legislative driver. So just focusing on the UK for a sec, down the left hand side we have, uh, this is the ORR's position on um, 
uh, ROG's requirements and uh, but that's the legislative uh, framework in the, the UK since 2006. So we have the main line, we have uh, the second column, light rail and metro systems, moving down to the third, heritage and uh, tram train and uh, tramways. Across the top, uh, we have the, the requirement that there's applies to that transport mode. And uh, risk models really sit somewhere in between. You've got risk assessments, safety management systems, and uh, safety certificates or authoriz authorization. So each of our operators should be able to, to demonstrate to the regulator that uh, they have the, the necessary uh, controls in place. And a risk model can be a, a, a key tool in being able to, to demonstrate this. So ORR, uh, the Office of Rail and Road, they are the, the regulator in the, the UK and they have you know, purview over each one of these uh, modes of transport. But it's interesting to note that rail safety legislation only really applies to the mainline railway. So not to, we have no, nothing that's rail specific for uh, light rail, metro, uh, heritage or uh, tram. Tram tends to get covered uh, by uh, road safety legislation, but for all intents and purposes, we, for, as far as ORR is concerned, they would take the uh, rail safety legislation that applies to the mainline railway and apply it proportionately to uh, the other modes of uh, the other transportation solutions, which has some interesting implications. So. Here we have uh, two examples of uh, the first one it happened back in 2015. Some of you will be familiar with uh, this uh, particularly uh, high risk SPAD in which the uh, heritage train that we see in the, the, the second photograph, uh, the train protection and warning system uh, was uh, isolated and the, the train passed a signal at danger and um, it could have derailed on the conflict point. Um, it came to a stop across the conflict point just a, about a, a couple of seconds after the intercity train that we see on the, the first picture passed at about 100 miles an hour. So we were uh, as close as we've been in the last uh, 10 years to a uh, multi-fatality, almost certainly, um, side impact high-speed high train collision. Uh, there is a statistic that's going around at the, the moment that in the UK we've been without a uh, a fatal accident in the in the UK for the last ten years, but uh, we've certainly come very close. Another impact to this uh, uh, legislative approach, we've got the Romney Highland Dimchurch Railway in uh, the south of England. This is a third scale. Railway, 15 inch gauge. If you look closely at that third picture, you can see the train driver is uh, sitting and the, the locomotive gives you an idea of the scale. And uh, it's certainly considered to be a little bit wee, but uh, with its 13 level crossings, it, it has quite a unique uh, risk profile. And uh, indeed there were, there were two fatal level crossing collisions uh, during the period 2003 to 2005. So it's uh, always worth uh, considering the uh, validity of some of these uh, assumptions that underpin our regulatory framework. In Australia and uh, the Middle East, uh, the legal context, uh, certainly in Australia, is the, the legal context is set by the, the Rail Safety Act 2012. Looking at uh, the Middle East, uh, Dubai, Doha and Riyadh, uh, they tend to look to Europe and the UK for uh, legislation and best practice. So they will make their own local legislation, but uh, uh, certainly for the design and maintenance operation of the, the metro and light rail that we see in the, the Middle East at the moment, uh, a lot of the requirements refer to a LARP, as low as is reasonably practicable. The Senelec standards, 50126, 8 and 9, uh, the safety directive, as is legislation in Europe, and the common safety method for risk evaluation and acceptance, sorry, and uh, assessment. So 
for those of you who are not familiar with the, the CSM, we have uh, three acceptance criteria that are referred to. You either, you either have uh, codes of practice, reference systems, or explicit risk estimation. So with uh, uh, risk models really sit in that, that third um, uh, acceptance criteria and become a, an essential tool in uh, managing risk to, to a LARP. I, I'd contend that really this third area is perhaps where if we have uh, good use of well-designed risk models, then perhaps we've got the, the greatest opportunity to, to achieve safety benefits in this uh, uh, third acceptance criteria through the application of that. It certainly tends to be a, uh, uh, a desire to choose either acceptance criteria one or two and perhaps avoid the, the difficulty uh, that may exist in creating some of these risk models. Stepping away from the legislative context, we've got the business context. So do we have a clear definition of the, the problems we're trying to solve for our business? Uh, typically, we've got these questions that float around the, the organization. What, what's the impact of doing X? Is it, is it worth it for our organization to uh, pursue this op option? Is X where I'll get this, the greatest safety benefit for my investment? So the impact of uh, doing X, where X might be a risk control action, you can have positive or negative impacts. So what hazards are being introduced? And this is where we see all the, uh, the, the process around engineering safety management coming into effect. But we're looking to make effective decisions and confident decisions. Taking a, a wider, less uh, life cycle stage dependent perspective, you've got all sorts of other, safety might be the driver and we've got our uh, obligation to manage risk to a LARP. But there are plenty of operational reasons for having our uh, transportation solutions out there. And we're looking to improve them all the time. So we've got faster trains, quicker dwell times, better service and more seats. Um, and we're trying to get a, a balanced view across all these drivers. You've also got your ethical perspective impact on the environment and uh, on our reputation and perhaps the reputation of the industry if it's particularly bad. As we've seen in the example of uh, one operator uh, in the UK in the last year, uh, just this is a quick example of a, a uh, no, system perturbation, you've got delays and on the left hand side you've got any range of causes that might contribute to those delays. On the right hand side, you've got some of the, the consequences. So the, the example I'm thinking of, and some of you will be familiar with, is uh, Southern Rail in uh, the UK, where their on-time running has uh, fallen 75% this year. So one in four trains will not get you to where you need to get to. And that's predominantly due to uh, union action and uh, strikes that have uh, resulted. But the interesting thing from, uh, for me has been the tangible effect on the, the economy in the, the South. Uh, so you see a dip in house prices, you see jobs being lost and job applications for folks who live in the area being rejected. So it's uh, interesting that uh, impact So risk models in terms of the system life cycle. Here we see a representation of the system life cycle. As most of you, uh, you may or may not be uh, familiar with uh, this. It's, uh, it, it comes from uh, 5126, 8 and 9, and uh, we see it through various other engineering standards. It's certainly becoming a uh, common practice and uh, has done in the last uh, 20 years. Uh, so as we move from concept through design and implementation uh, to ops and ma maintenance. There are uh, ex exercises um, typically associated with each stage of this life cycle. Just want to throw up a number of the models uh, that we're considering today and think about where they sit with respect to the system life cycle. 
So the first one up there, GBSRM, very much around the operation and maintenance of uh, the railway today. The Railcorp QRM, uh, we start to, the Railcorp had uh, a, a design maintenance and operation in its scope. Therefore, you see uh, a lot more about the engineering design controls and uh, the safety change process is being applied uh, as part of the, the, the assurance behind the QRM. Uh, the Irish rail uh, risk model and uh, what we see in the Middle East, um, they roughly align with the, the uh, rail court quantified risk model. Uh, on the uh, uh, design front, the, your design and build contractors uh, working um, uh, and the solutions that they uh, have uh, typically on the, the left hand side of the V. Whereas our level crossing risk models very much focused on um, a particular infrastructure um, risk uh, concern uh, for our infrastructure managers. So whose responsibility is it to prepare uh, these risk models? Well, you've got your regulator, you've got uh, design and build contractors, you've got project managers and directors within um, our key decision making entities. And then you've got your operations and uh, maintenance managing director. So the, there's a different solution for every uh, every uh, rail system uh, in each country across the, the world. And so, uh, but there's ultimately there's uh, one rail system that uh, needs to be uh, assured. So if we take a, a closer look at some of the uh, models that are out there, just considering matrices first and qualitative uh, approaches to assessing, uh, prioritizing uh, safety uh, attention. Uh, this is uh, an example of uh, a qualitative matrix that would get applied at the design stage. And uh, we can see that the contours of, uh, if we can see the uh, arrow, you can see the, the contours of risk of curve and bend and tend off to um, uh, a uh, a particular level of risk. So we get this uh, contours of risk that uh, are curved. And if we look at this uh, rather more well-designed matrix, uh, we see consistency from one box diagonally down to the right. So the risk in this box would be the same as the, the risk in this box. And this is a particularly well-designed uh, risk matrix in which the factors are quite consistent on the frequency side and the factors are quite consistent on the, uh, the consequence side. And the good design of a risk matrix will uh, uh, reap rewards ultimately in terms of uh, being able to align your qual quantitative assessments with your qualitative. If you're uh, not considering the design early enough in the, um, in the, the life cycle, then you can find yourself moving from one matrix to another and maybe even to a third, which uh, all amounts to uh, lost time and lost productivity. So some of the advantages of uh, these qualitative approaches are that they can be used, perceived to be more easily used by uh, a great number of people. We've got, uh, they're very good for prioritizing into big buckets, but uh, they can be easy to use badly. So what we saw on the left uh, is uh, not as well designed as the, the, the one on the right. Uh, there's a tendency to overestimate the, the benefit that you're getting from controls that are being considered um, uh, to shift them into the next box. But the, the granularity of some of these matrices are typically between 25 and uh, times so the, the risk uh, covered by one box would typically be a factor of 25 up to 100 and uh, to suggest that uh, each control is going to have that kind of impact it's uh, pretty easy to overestimate so uh, first say not not appropriate for the use of uh, control cost benefit analysis just extending out from safety we see uh, the use of matrices on the enterprise front um, so we have a number of consequences here, financial, environment, operational performance, whichever one we select here, 
changes all the descriptions that we see in the, the boxes here. And it's not just about uh, the negative impact of uh, an option on the table, but also the, the positive. So here we're looking at uh, a matrix that's compliant with ISO 31000 and um, uh, would be regarded as uh, best practice uh, for, for today. With the, the, on the more quantitative approach, looking at the UK safety risk model, here we have uh, the more complex uh, system safety hazardous events being represented by fault trees and event trees. So out of 130 odd uh, hazardous events, perhaps 20 of the, the more complex hazardous events receive this dedicated and uh, detailed representation of the risk. Uh, fault trees trying to understand all the causal factors um, both hardware, software, and uh, person related, and on the event tree, the escalation factors, um, uh, giving a granular representation of the risk and the, the consequences. So, the strengths of the UK safety risk model is fantastic at re representing the picture of the risk and um, uh, segmenting it into. Uh, usable chunks. The, it provides a fantastic foundation for uh, detailed cost-benefit analysis and setting industry uh, strategy, uh, such as the, the removal of uh, TPWS, train protection and warning system, and uh, the foundation for regulators' consideration of higher levels of safety. So that's a, a program, how much uh, safety reward benefit am I going to get if I give you this much money over the next control period? The weaknesses of the, uh, the safety risk model, which I acknowledge are not really part of the design of uh, the safety risk model, are that th there are no risk controls in there. Um, it's not designed for uh, risk management. It's safety only, so all those enterprise uh, categories that we looked at earlier, they don't get, uh, typically don't get uh, represented in the safety risk model unless you're doing a focused uh, <clears throat> exercise. And for the most part, the risk is uh, it's considered to be retrospective, so you're looking back, you're looking at data and um, considering where you don't have data, you're making some estimates as to uh, the frequency and consequences of a, a particular scenario. This is in the effort to uh, fill in the gaps and uh, provide some predictive uh, ability. There's little granularity uh, for the train operators uh, by route or by location for either collective or individual risk. Um, that's not to take away from the, the templates, which uh, are designed to scale the, the safety risk model to each operators, uh, give them a starting point for their risk profile. Uh, th for level crossings, we see a similar approach adopted both uh, Australia and the UK. Here we're looking at the, uh, a schematic of the Australian uh, process flow, series of inputs, and uh, we have our assumed model in terms of consequences, exposure, and infrastructure factors. And the outputs, uh, we're looking for either high consequence flags, particular outcomes and uh, uh, equivalent fatalities for our train occupants, uh, the vehicle occupants and anybody who may be on a, an adjacent platform or a nearby platform. So these are good examples of getting robust uh, line of sight across a uh, population of uh, complex problems. Looking at uh, Railcorp's quantitative risk model, um, what we're seeing here is a, uh, a set of uh, controls, and uh, in particular the control owners, who's got responsibility, um, who considers the control to be valid and uh, in place and effective. Um, as we move from the control and the control owners, you've got uh, an indication of where that control is considered to be a control against which cause in which hazardous event. If it's on the preventative side or obviously on, on the mitigative side, uh, you'd have a, a different perspective. But 
this uh, key tenet of uh, risk management is uh, being able to provide transparency to uh, those both in uh, our organization and uh, those industry partners with whom we're, we're managing risk uh, across the interface. Some of the more detailed numbers-based uh, models considering uh, user work crossings. Uh, you've got uh, on the, the top, you've got a rather more numbers-driven approach. Um, the Some input distributions are, are assumed and uh, they're fired at a, a typical level crossing, a typical user work crossing to give you a probability of fatality for each uh, user that's built up over time. So you're firing lots of scenarios at, at uh, this uh, level crossing, uh, to each level crossing, perhaps a million, and uh, coming up with a probability of fatality for uh, per million traverses. Uh, down the bottom, you're looking at structures over track. So structures over track, I mean uh, bridges and car parks, shopping centers, any, um, uh, airspace development that could have a population in it and we we were considering the probability of fatality uh, sorry probability of derailment of a uh, train on the approach to that airspace development such that it takes out the piers and uh, collapses the over the airspace development so that that uh, risk model was of uh, designed following a particularly significant event in Australian history. So yeah, 1977 had the, the Granville um, uh, derailment and subsequent uh, collapse of a bridge killing uh, 84 people. So looking across all of our quantitative uh, risk models, the, some of the strengths are the deep granularity that uh, we're able to achieve and they're particularly suited for control cost benefits analysis. Some of the weaknesses are that we tend to get less people who can create them, who can use them, understand and interpret them. And then there's the element of cost. Are we taking them off the shelf? Do we have a, a, a fully developed risk model that uh, represents one organization that might take a, um, a uh, knowledgeable, competent hand to, to be able to tailor it to another operation? Um, so you do have uh, off-the-shelf solutions, but cost and capability of uh, uh, developing and using a risk model are uh, things that need to be considered uh, explicitly at the outset. One might say that uh, application of life cycle uh, principles to the to the design and use of a risk model should uh, be a, a bit more prevalent in uh, today's. Uh, environment. So another weakness of the risk models is that they're not genuinely predictive. Uh, there's very few out there and um, I'd be interested to hear from uh, the folks listening today whether uh, your thoughts on the predictive nature of the risk models out there. Um, I know that uh, RSSB are uh, focusing some attention in this uh, uh, arena, but uh, I've yet to see a, a truly genuinely predictive model. And there's, that raises the interesting question, how predictive do they need to be? If we have structured approaches to knowing where our fault sequences lie, then is it not sufficient to try and address those in a, a structured way? Which brings us to Leveson's um, social, uh, systems theoretic process uh, analysis. So for those of you who haven't heard of this, it's uh, a way of considering uh, uh, an operating process out there. So you might have a, an operator, you've got a control system and all sorts of uh, control feedback loops between the, the operator and, uh, and the system. So there's not a lot new about that, but that, that there, if we consider this operating process in the context of the much wider socio-technical system and consider the, the feedback loops that exist between the various levels 
in this system. Now, I mentioned that uh, if the resolution is a bit small, you'll be able to um, pick up on this on the, the detailed uh, PDF a little bit later. Also, uh, there are STPAs uh, out there for anyone to search on the, the internet. There's certainly a, a lot of uh, merit in considering system constraints, you know, commandments, if you like, that uh, um, should not be, um, uh, should always be met, should not be traversed. And uh, using a structured approach such as, as this to, uh, as a different way of identifying our hazards and uh, perhaps more comprehensive than uh, anything that uh, we've seen before. So some further uses of uh, our risk model as well. Uh, the, the use of risk models in the, the system lifecycle tends to be a, a one-way street, but uh, I'd like to see more of uh, risk operations and maintenance risk models being used to develop a requirement specifications for tomorrow's railway. Um, it should be more of a, a circle rather than a, a, a information flow, rather than a, a one-way street. Uh, looking at uh, design and build stage, uh, the system definition that we see as part of the application of the common safety method is really a, our attempt at understanding some of the uncertainties with uh, the system that we're designing. And uh, that is effectively a risk model. That's what the, the purpose of a risk model is. So much more use of uh, risk models at the design and uh, build stage will certainly go. Uh, uh, they have to be well designed, but uh, will go a long way towards creating a, a better system. In uh, the ops and maintenance sphere, we've got a design of organizations that uh, you know, how many folks do I need in particularly safety critical roles? Uh, what size of teams am I uh, designing into my uh, operator and maintainer? Just uh, in the interest of time, just pushing on, we've got some systemic challenges out there now. Uh, for those of us joining from Australia, I'm sure you've heard of um, this uh, Brexit uh, choice that uh, countries made uh, to leave the European Union. So whether you're in or out, um, cons I'm considering the impact of uh, Brexit on uh, the EU's desire and uh, Britain's desire to share information. And I think whether you're in or out, I think it's just become a, a lot more difficult um, to uh, work together collaboratively and um, that's going to mean that it's, it takes a lot longer for us to learn lessons that perhaps we would have uh, uh, otherwise learnt with uh, collaborative sharing and it's, it's probably going to come at a greater cost as well. Uh, the question of ownership of risk models uh, can be uh, tricky and uh, we have uh, multiple players at various stages of the life cycle, which makes a through life cycle approach for risk models that much more challenging. Um, that's really uh, a question for uh, our, the government representatives designing and regulators who are designing our industry. Um, the franchise uh, arrangements that we see in uh, privatized industry has a an undesirable effect on uh, decision making. So uh, there's typically a lot of it, money available in the first couple of years and plenty of decisions to be made and you might uh, see risk modeling activity uh, underpinning those in the first couple of years, but then not a lot for the, the next five years where everyone's just looking to rein in the spending and you get this uh, short term view. That's particularly uh, poor side effects for uh, the, in the interest of system innovation and uh, system safety advances. So just to, to wrap up, um, hopefully I've uh, given you some uh, insights into uh, risk models that are being used across uh, railways, metros and trams today. Um, my position would be that 
we've got uh, an opportunity to make much better use of uh, risk models uh, earlier uh, on in the, the system life cycle. So the, the earlier the better, there's certainly some significant benefit to achieve there. Uh, they do need to be aligned with the, the decision-making entities. So um, currently you've got your yeah, uh, design and build contractors, you might have your operator maintainer being uh, separate entities. I think we're seeing a little bit more of design, build, operate and maintain um, folks. So the through system life cycle risk model might be a, a, a little bit more uh, easy to achieve. What do we want from our risk models? Well, we, I, we need them to be discovering risk that we're not managing or perhaps not managing as effectively as uh, we could. And that, that is rarely uh, articulated as one of the, the objectives. Where possible, I'm going to try and keep it simple, as my old uh, physics teacher used to say. And uh, that last point there about flexibility. Um, so we've got a constantly changing world that's uh, innovating. Autonomous mobility is a key one at the moment and um, it's going to have uh, a significant impact on um, today's mobility solutions. So uh, our risk models need to be flexible to account for innovation and uh, significant innovation of that. So this brings us to uh, the end of uh, the, the main webinar. Um, I'd uh, like to alert you to uh, and invite you to uh, CRA's eighth annual risk forum. Uh, we hold a, a forum each year. We bring together experts and uh, leading thinkers from uh, across uh, across the globe, really. Um, and so we're in Sirencester this year in the in the UK, and so we've got a range of uh, industries represented and. Um, if you've found uh, today useful and thought-provoking, then perhaps uh, the uh, forum a little bit later in the year might be of uh, interest to yourself because uh, there will be uh, plenty of uh, more quality uh, presentations at that. So I uh, might uh, see a couple of you there. So thank you very much for joining me today. Let's have a, a little look at some of the, the questions that have uh, come through. Um, so we have uh, Monica's uh, raised a question uh, and uh, do you think uh, risk models are being used enough to understand or underpin the economic impacts of decisions? Well certainly um, we uh, we have uh, particular players in the industry who are trying to do the right thing um, and uh, adopt a, a structured approach to uh, using uh, risk models at uh, various stages of the, the life cycle. Um, so my, my short answer would be no, there's uh, not uh, enough use, but the, the, really it's about the, the complexity of the decision that uh, needs to be taken and at the level at which the 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 um, the decision needs to be taken so the more guiding minds the more deciding minds the the greater the need for a, a risk model you mentioned that there are different safety models uh, risk model systems globally would it be beneficial if there were more if there were a more standardized approach or are all the systems fairly similar? There are certainly commonalities um, that uh, would suggest that whether you're, whether you're looking at heavy rail, uh, light rail, metro or tram, that there is a, a common core and uh, a common life cycle approach being applied um, across that uh, core such that uh, a risk model that allows uh, folks to develop a railway from concept through to um, operational maintenance and uh, I haven't seen one retired yet. Um, there's a, uh, an opportunity there to, to get a common core and allow for 
um, uh, the peculiarities, the particular nature of each operation um, and the design of each operation to be represented adequately. Um, absolutely. So the process being applied is the same and um, the, the flexibility can be built into those risk models to um, reflect the peculiarities. Uh, Don, uh, we have a question from Don. What is the state of the use of risk models for rail systems in the USA? Well, the USA is a, a country in which I have not worked as, uh, as yet. Um, looking at some of the uh, incidents that have taken place there, though, in uh, USA and Canada uh, over the, the last uh, five to ten years, we see plenty of uh, examples of uh, incidents that uh, you know, similar to Sandylands in the, the UK with the tram, um, they really should not be happening. Um, the ones I'm thinking of, a uh, uh, Canadian example, um, like uh, Megantic, um, uh, about uh, between 40 and 50 people dead after a, uh, a freight train was effectively left with a handbrake off and um, something like 60 million cubic litres of um, flammable liquid um, rolled into town at high speed uh, during the night. In the US, I'm thinking of um, uh, the Franklin uh, curve um, with um, the uh, it was an overspeed derailment from a, a guy who's perfectly competent and um, was, by all accounts, the, the, the gentleman that you'd always want driving your train and uh, for as yet undetermined human factors uh, took the curve too fast but uh, um, we have train protection systems that had been implemented but had not been turned on and commissioned at uh, that stage so that's uh, on the, the east coast of the, the state so there are plenty of um, accidents that are still taking place which would indicate that um, structured decision making has some way to go in um, uh, in the US and uh, Canada. I'm not excluding uh, the UK just because we've got had 10 uh, years of uh, uh, a period without fatal accidents. Uh, as mentioned, we've got plenty of uh, near misses which um, should not be happening. And uh, I can't really exclude the, the tramways, uh, seven fatalities that we saw at the end of uh, 2016, which if we, we've known of those kinds of incidents for, you know, if the, they've been addressed on the mainline railway over the last 50 years. So why they are still uh, able to, to happen on a, a tramway. And uh, we end up with seven fatalities is, uh, a question that I'm sure many are thinking about at the moment. Uh, Don again, uh, with regards to the use of risk models in the design of rail systems, what are the benefits of using a risk model relative to using a generic set of risk-informed guidelines? Um, well, a generic set of risk-informed guidelines will never um, replace or be a substitute for a structured understanding of a system and how the various system components are working together or more importantly not working together. Um, the complexities of even a simple system are never going to be addressed by a, a set of generic guidelines I would, I would contend. Uh, thank you very much for your questions. Uh, Don, I hope that's uh, been useful for yourself uh, to um, that have uh, answered your questions uh, successfully. Um, if we have maybe uh, a couple of minutes, no, I think we're 
out of time. So I'll take this opportunity to say thank you very much. Sorry for pushing over time. Um, and uh, I hope you found it useful and uh, look forward to the next invites that we'll uh, send out in a, a month or so for the next in our webinar series. Uh, so have a good day, everyone, wherever you are around the world and um, stay safe.